Well, if I take it to the grassroots, I would imagine in whole docks. I've now been, I've gradually moved up through the ranks of the TNG until I'm now its national chairman. And as such, I have a, an image, I would imagine, through um, our publications, that I can communicate with the membership at large through our re press releases or through our newspapers. But within my own area, the docks, I would imagine, quite justifiably, that the lads will say, oh, he's gone over, he's one of the others, he's one of the uh, full-timers and as such. There's a general distrust about trade union leaders as that, in that sense. Because, um, and, and I would be seen from their point of view as that, because I am not every day on the docks, I am not there to be accountable. I still stand each year as a shop steward, and fortunately up to now I've always been elected as one. And I firmly believe, uh, I hope I always will stand as a shop steward. But I can understand that their criticism of me is that, that I'm not there to be accountable every day. And because I'm not there to be accountable to them every day, then they would think uh, that I'm not following the beliefs that I always advocated. Do you think that any part of that problem is due to the media, the national media and local media for that matter? I would think that's almost a certainty. Uh, the media in general, and that's the papers, the newspapers, the television, the radio, uh, certainly have never been very sympathetic to the trade union movement and they are anxious to portray people such as myself. If it can sell a newspaper to say that I'm a good guy, then I presume they would say, well, let's portray him as a good guy. But if it sells more to portray me as a bad guy, then I'd be a bad guy forevermore. And that's how the uh, press have always been. And it's simpler to criticise the trade union movement because the press is not owned by people such as us. The press is owned by the... Uh, the system, if you want to talk about the capitalist system, and we very rare get a, a fair press, we, you know, never mind a, a progressive press, we get very rarely get a fair one. So I would think that the general consensus of opinion in an area is that um, the paper is telling the truth, and uh, it's only when it's talking about the people concerned that they know it's a lie or an exaggeration. So that the press and the media in general have a tremendous responsibility, I think, for the um, attempts to discredit the trade union movement. Walter, in your opinion, what is a trade union? Well, according to our rule book, it's something to represent and improve the conditions of working people. But of course, I think now that it's gone beyond that because of the fact that we now need to represent the views of people who are no longer working. And it becomes a, a very... Uh, political organisation in the sense that we have to represent the views. We have a, an enormous backing, an enormous organisation. We can put across the views to governments and we can organise views and we can collect views. So consequently we, we are in a very much more responsible position in the fact that we are not just representing working people, we're representing uh, people in general and we have to try and uh, put those views across to whichever government is in power at the time. The gist of your an answer is that you're, that you're a defensive organisation and that you're protecting uh, the conditions uh, of employment of both members and potential members or ex-members. But do you see a role for the trade unions which is um, rather more political? Almost certainly. I, I would accept your criticism with what I've said that it's been a defensive organisation. That's been its... Uh, Base because basically we've been, uh, as an organisation, opposed to what's ever been there. We're trying to progress, but I think it's also something more than that now. It is a, a political organisation, um, trade union as a whole, in the sense that we are reaching the levels as has been reached in other countries, that uh, we represent a large voice and we are not, well, we should not be just fighting in a rear guard action we are actually advocating what is what what is wanted in a country we've gone beyond the stage of saying we just want more wages we want shorter hours we've gone to a stage now 
where we're talking about the actual organisation and running of the country. And in that sense, I'm not talking about that we are usurping the authority of governments, but we are party, are a part of that government. I mean, even in today's terms, the TUC represents over 10 million people, 10 million working people. That's a tremendous number. I'm not saying that all, every one of those people um, believe the same as the TUC or believe or our membership and we're at present 1.7 million. I'm not saying that all those 1.7 million believe as I believe. That would be impossible. It would be a load of clones and I don't believe in cloning. I believe that people are of a right to an opinion. The trade union movement has its meetings every week. The shop floor are talking. They are saying to its representatives, we want this, we want it at regional level, we want it at national level, we want it international level. There are views going on all the time, so the trade union movement have the feel of the shop floor, of the general working class. No one else has, and so consequently, the, shop, the trade union movement should be the people who are consulted about the movement of the country as a whole. Now, at a time when the trade unions have been attacked for a number of years, the power base has been eroded, uh, partly by unemployment as well. What future do you see for the labour movement, with particular, uh, and in particular, what uh, role do you see them playing in achieving your new society? Well, I think that the trade union movement is the only way we're ever going to move towards the social society, and certainly conservative governments have seen in the past the threat to their capitalist society, which is posed by the movement. I accept that in the present day, that the movement has been, we've lost a tremendous number of members uh, due to the fact that a tremendous number of people are unemployed, and we've uh, traditionally relied for our membership on employed people. But if you are to achieve your goal, uh, this new society, the problems r relating to unemployment, uh, however they are caused, will have to be somehow dealt with. Do you have any ideas about how best that could be done? Well, for example, we're spending 14 billion a year on armaments. Um, a simple case would be that if we simply just stopped producing armaments, and then and paid the people who are at present doing it the same wage that they are getting now. We would still have billions that we use in materials available for reinvestment in in usefully um, useful products. What's the good of producing uh, atomic weapons, atomic submarines? Basically, they are neither use nor ornament for anything. But they're just a waste of this society's finances. We build a uh, nuclear submarine, I don't know how many billions it costs, but all right, provided work for the men that build it. But how much more useful it would have been if those men had been building a ferry such as that one over there to, to, to make it um, for people to use rather than to send it out there to sit under the Atlantic for the next three months, you know, in order to threaten someone else with uh, destruction of the world. That ain't my idea of a society. There is the finances available. There is finances available uh, in the Western world immediately. If we just transfer it away from the spending on destruction to spending it on progress, then there's already finances there to employ people, to make usefully social products that will make it worthwhile. I mean, to suggest that you need international trade agreements for that, I mean, is, um, is ludicrous. You can waste all the money on something which, when it's built, is already obsolete. And if it's ever used, then it's only for our ultimate destruction. So I think it's just a, a nonsense to say that there isn't the facilities or anything out there to do it now. Yeah. So you can conceive of a, a plan and a scenario where unemployment or the, the worst effects of unemployment can be ended or alleviated. But you also um, are not in favour of uh, work as such. Uh, you, uh, you physical work. would physical work. Yeah, yeah. Well, that that makes me sound as if I'm idle. I'm not. But the, um, I don't think we would ever want. I know the docks, which is my industry. Nobody ever wants to come in the morning and start with a shovel, shoveling iron ore or copper ore or any of those products for eight or ten or twelve hours a day. And this was uh, 
when I was doing this, I was in my 20s. It didn't work, but I was hurt to think, and I don't think there's very men on the dock who would like to go back to that kind of physical work now. So I believe that the, the modernization of the industry should be that we should be providing machines to do it. But don't, by doing that, automatically dispense with the men. I've never been down a coal mine. I've had offers to go, and I'm intending to go down. But I can't imagine that very many people are happy going down coal mines. Uh, they go down there because that's their way of, of financing their families. That they've no other way. They were born into that area in the same way as I was born into a Dockland area. And ultimately, regardless of the fact my father didn't want me to be a docker, I still ended up a docker. And I suppose in the same way as in the uh, in the pits. Uh, miners don't want the sons to be miners, but they've ultimately gone down there usually because there's nothing else and because I suppose there's a kind of automatic transition from school days into work days and you go to the place where your parents are in any case. But I don't think anybody likes being down there. If somebody says to the, all the miners, well we can uh, pay you a lot more for being on the surface, receiving that coal, because the coal will be brought out of there by machine, then I'm sure they'd be a lot happier than going down there and spending their shift at coal face, uh, inhaling the dust and the dirt. And I mean, every film I see of miners is coming out of a pit smiling. Well, I think I'd smile when I came out the thing. I wouldn't smile when I went in it. But when, I, when you see them in the wash house, you know, and they're all smiling and laughing, I think that's with relief, you know, that's another one done, you know. What happens if miners receive their salaries but don't have to work? Well, when I said don't have to work, what I, what I did say was that there would be found work on the surface in some ways. I mean, they would be, wouldn't be doing the physical work that there is to do now. But again, you know, if, if, if we reach the ultimate society where people don't have to work, where I never found any lack of people at Ascot walking around with the the top hatch. You know when, when there's a big race meeting and it's the Gold Cup or something like that, you look there and it's packed with people in top hats and there's Rolls Royces all over. Now, I don't know if them people have ever worried about being bored by the fact that they didn't have to go down the pit on Monday morning or didn't have to come on the dock or work in the corner there in the, in the freezing cold. They was quite happy to do nothing and receive a good life. Now, if we receive, if modernization reaches the stage where we don't have to work, and things can be produced by machine. And that should be to the benefit of people, not to the detriment. But of course, we have to start altering our outlook on life. When I left school, or when I was at school, the first thing they taught me, and they taught everyone else, I mean, you've got to learn to obey, because you can't do anything unless you do as you're told. And I grew up in that concept, you know, that it was a marvelous thing that the best people on earth were the ones that did as they was told, you know. Um, while I was being taught this, I found out that in later life, I found out that the children of the uh, other society were being taught to lead. You know, they were never taught to obey. They were taught, being taught at the public schools that you're the future inheritors of the earth and they have massive fodder out there that'll do as you tell them if you tell them to do it right. And they developed the t system that taught us enough to be able to do the kind of work that they wanted. I don't think that the Education Act originally was ever provided to, for benefit for people, it was a method of teaching people to be able to do more for the people that control the society. So if we're to achieve what I want to achieve, then we've got to alter the education system. I never learned anything of the arts when I was at school. I mean, when people left school at 14, they knew how to read, and they knew how to write, uh, they knew a little bit of geography, they knew that the uh, majority of the world was red, read in the sense that it belonged to the British, British that we'd control the world from this little island at some past time. So that if we start looking for an educational system that teaches people to appreciate the arts, which would be poo-pooed now by the average worker, say, oh God, you know, why waste money on that? That's because we've never been taught to appreciate it. I mean, I'd never appreciated uh, being able to go to an art gallery. I've been offered, since I've been uh, a member of the executive, I get offered chances to go to see symphonies. I never, I've never appreciated music. Not because I didn't want to, but because basically I never started off with the education to appreciate it. So there's a facility there that if people are not going to be expected to work the kind of hours that we've been expected to work in the past, that there is more leisure, then we should start teaching children 
from school age that the leisure is that, that there's an industry there of leisure that there is a future for them to go around without being threatened by uh, ultimate destruction by some maniac pressing the button and without somebody having to go down into a coal man and dig coal or a docker to shovel iron ore in order to provide their leisure that leisure should be for everyone and there's there's ample there's enough on this earth to provide everyone on earth with a good life and there's enough modernized machinery the microchip should be there should be welcomed it shouldn't be said we shouldn't be going in fear and having to make um, threatening noises that we won't receive it and being accused of being Luddites of course Luddites people have talked about as being Luddites as if it's a derogatory term a Luddite was a person who was fighting for survival and to, to now to call a person a Luddite as a, a, a threat in the same way as people have said that I've been called every historism over the various years uh, from the employers and other people I have no desire to to live away as I've been told I should go and live in one of these countries that, where I say they've got some good systems I want to live here but I want this society to provide the best that I can uh, see for everyone not just for a few that happen to be able to trot along to Ascot every so often in the top hats How hopeful are you? Are you less hopeful than you were, say, 10 or 20 years ago? Or more hopeful? Ah, very difficult. Uh, I don't suppose that anybody in our society expects we're going to get what we want tomorrow. I don't, you know, I just think that probably the best gravestone you could ever have would be one that said he helped towards to move uh, socialism. That'd be the nicest thing you could ever have on your gravestone. I don't think anyone is ever going to have it on their gravestone that says he achieved it, because it will be a process that that is taught so that it comes in troughs and and uh, crests in the same way as economics do. I think that sometimes we we seem to be approaching it. I was having a look at the Labour Party manifesto for 1945 yesterday. Very interesting, and. Uh, if you look at it today, you would say that was a tremendous progress to, uh, towards socialism, and I think it was. We lost a little bit and lost more, and we've moved back towards a capitalist society, but of course, in the intervening period, and everybody immediately jumps on and says, well, we're better off than we were then. But the cake's got bigger. The whole cake has got bigger, and but we still don't receive a larger slice of it. And I think I told you what, made me into a socialist was when I was in the Navy and I lived on a ship where one third of the area uh, had one man, the Admiral. Uh, one third of the ship had 200 men living in it and the other third had 600 men living in it. Now somewhere along the line it's very simple to see that, that there's something wrong with that kind of system. But it was no good building a bigger ship if you still have the same ratios. You've still got one man with a third and 200 men with a third and 600 men with a third. The fact that it's a bigger ship and everybody's got a bit more room doesn't make you any more equal. And so that if, if we've got to use the, the idea of a national cake, then what I'm saying is that we need to get further into that national cake. There's got to be more shared out. And what's happened in the, in the past is that the cake's got bigger, but the ordinary person has not received any more as a ratio than uh, he did be, uh, at the end of the war than the, uh, or before the war. So consequently, when you say we're we moving towards what I want, I don't think we're progressing uh, anywhere near the speed that I'd like to see it achieved. But I really do feel that the young people that I meet, I mean, some of them have funny haircuts and all that, but that is immaterial, it's what's under that hair. And, uh, Why? Uh, you have well, yeah, great here, hardly. But the point is about it that that uh, the young people, I think, are more progressive. I think they are moving. There is a feeling for a socialism that I mean, they, they get uh, put off by what's on the radio, on the television, and the newspapers uh, saying that 
if you want that kind of thing, go live in Russia. Now, that's the standard cry. And that isn't what I want. I just want a society all over the world where people are treated as equal, because they are equal. What do you think the bulk of your members think of the work that you do? Well, I would imagine the people who are not activists. The activists recognise what I do, uh, because basically they're doing the same in, in their own way. But the others, the non-activists, would probably think chairman of the union, president, probably drives around in a big car and lives in a nice house. When I was elected the chairman, and there was quite a large piece in the local press, um, people was actually knocking on the door of my council house where I live, this house, asking us when we were moving, when we'd be moving to my estate somewhere in London. You know, and uh, I think they were bitterly disappointed, the fact that we weren't moving and this house would be free for them to take over. So uh, I don't intend to move, I'm quite happy here and I intend to remain here. But I can understand why people believe that, it's because that's the kind of thing that the media has taught them to believe trade union leaders, if you count me in that sense, they're taught to believe that that's the way we live. Why do you, why do you continue to work in the union? Because I love it. I, I haven't got any other interests. I mean, uh, I'm not unique. I mean, there's thousands of us. The, the people that play the active part in local politics, um, you know, the, the ordinary, of every political persuasion, the people you know, who I, I could laugh at some of the Tory people who, who work for the Tory party, but they do exactly the same for their party as I do for my party and for my trade union movement. That they, they do it because they believe in it, and I actually believe. I would. I couldn't do it unless I believed it. Uh, you couldn't live the kind of life I lived uh, in order to get something out of it for yourself. You've got to believe what you do. You've got to enjoy what you do, and uh, and that's basically the only reason I do it. I suppose. I can't understand. I was once asked um, why on the docks, in, in the old system on the docks, the majority of uh, extra earnings was made by working overtime. And uh, we used to find quite a large number of people who maybe refused to work weekend because they wanted to go fishing and go sit in a boat somewhere at sea and dangle a worm over the same. And uh, me, I thought, how oh, the hell does people want to do that? But that was their turn off. That's what they believed in. They loved the idea of sitting there. I love the idea of attending conferences and doing the trade union work. And, and whereas I'm aiming to take the movement somewhere if I can, then all the time I'm aiming that way, I'm also enjoying what I'm doing as well. But would you equate sitting on a boat in fishing or working for the Tory party, no matter how hard, with the work which you and so many others described by you do in for the trade union and labour movement? Yeah, because the end, the end result of that guy sitting with his worm on the end of a piece of string is to catch a fish. The end result of my life's work is socialism. And if he can catch a fish, I can catch socialism.